Okay, I wasn't initially gonna answer this because I don't wanna sit here and like list off things and take credit for things, but I think I have a way of framing it that might make sense to a lot of people. And that is, ask yourself, would a white man want me to do this? If the answer is yes, then I don't do it. If the answer is no, then I definitely do it. <laughs> so would a white man want me to go to the gym and get strong and bulky? No, they've made that very, very clear. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna do it. Would a white man want me to have short hair? No, they hate it. So I'm gonna shave my head. Would a white man want me to be more polite and soft-spoken? Yes, then I'm definitely not doing it. Do you see what I'm saying? And I think a lot of white women are gonna hear these things and say, no, those are just feminine standards. They're not. Because you know who cares about those things? White men. You know who doesn't care about those things? My friends, my male friends that are not white. They literally don't care. So maybe it's like an exposure thing. Those are definitely white feminine standards. My name's Katie and I am a non-binary teacher. This isn't what I'd normally wear to teach, but we're closed down today for cleaning. Thanks, COVID. But anyway, I wanted to show you guys a little something and tell you about a project that I'm doing. So follow me. This is my classroom. I'm pretty fond of it. It's looking a little spare right now, but we're in a bit of a transition as far as holidays go. And this is my classroom library. And as you can see, it has a lot of books, but there's one big problem with it. None of them look or act or feel like me. So you can help by going to the link in my profile and donating to my Donors Choose project to get more LGBTQ plus friendly books in our school from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. Thanks. This is a good question. When people say that intersectionality is an additive, they may be referring to a common misunderstanding of intersectional thought. That being at the intersection of oppressions means simply experiencing those oppressions as if they were added on to each other. For example, an additive approach would view the experiences of black women as simply racism plus misogyny. And I use that example because it's that kind of misconception that led to the formation of intersectional thought in the first place. Black women needed a better way to conceptualize their lived experiences than viewing them as simply the combination of the misogyny that white women face and the racism that black men face. And this view ultimately treats oppressions as separable, since they're conceptualized as stacking on top of each other like layers. Which again goes against a basic tenet of intersectionality, that systems of oppression are inextricable and act as one. As Kimberly Crenshaw said, intersectionality is an additive, it's fundamentally reconstitutive. This means that the intersections of oppression create a wholly new experience. The combination of oppressions forges a reality that is uniquely distinct from experiencing either of those oppressions alone. Again, for example, black women end up facing an oppression that is in many ways different from the racism that black men face and the misogyny that white women face. The intersection of anti-black racism and misogyny, or misogynoir as Moya Bailey termed it, take on unique characteristics that reconstitute it as a novel experience. For black women, gender is always racialized and race is always gendered. Again, the axes are inseparable. But this example is still very simplified since I'm only talking about racism and sexism. If we were to look at this from a truly complex intersectional lens, then we'd have to contend with other intersections such as cisnormativity, sexuality, nation. These things would also compound that misogynoir to again create new experiences. As one writer said, the reconstitutive nature of intersectionality lies within its potential to constantly complicate known narratives and expose completely new ways of being. The additive view of intersectionality also leads people to try to rank oppressions, 
since they've mistakenly viewed oppressions as separable, quantifiable things that are capable of being added or subtracted to one another. While it's certainly true that intersectionality can be used to understand how multiple oppressions can complicate people's experiences relative to one another, it doesn't assert that these oppressions or privileges can be placed within any sort of hierarchy. Hopefully my explanation makes sense. Let me know if there's anything that needs to be further clarified. And as always, here's some further reading for your reference. What's considered classy if you're white, but trashy if you're a person of color? The fun I'm about to have with this. Speaking multiple languages when your first language wasn't English. I mean being bilingual. Living in a trailer or mobile home. I mean tiny homes and hashtag van life. Reusing plastic containers from products like spreadable butter, dip, that kind of thing. I mean being eco-friendly and recycling. Having a lot of kids and using social welfare programs to support them. I mean opening your home and heart to foster disadvantaged youth. Thrifting your clothes, housewares, appliances, anything. I mean practicing sustainability. Getting pregnant out of wedlock. I mean being a strong independent woman who's so brave to choose to have a child on her own. Getting emotional when you're speaking on topics of race and racial injustices. I mean being a passionate ally and activist. Joining a gang. Becoming a police officer. An update on the Spotify disinformation saga. Turns out employees are vocally upset about the situation and their concerns are being addressed on their internal Slack. The Verge got their hands on some screenshots. Apparently they have the best experts for viewing the podcast along the following guidelines. Here is their content policy and it is so specific as to be meaningless. Encouraging the deliberate contraction of a disease is not allowed, but constantly sharing information that leads people to make decisions that make them contract it? Fine, I guess. You can't suggest that people consume bleep, but platforming a doctor that made his disinformation name telling people to consume other substances that can cause them harm? Not a problem. These guidelines just make it seem like misinformation is like a direct consequence problem, when the reality is much more complex and the consequences affect all people, not just the people who are following the direct instructions of the podcast. When people listen to doctors like Peter McCullough and they go out and get their own hydroxychloroquine prescriptions, the people who bear the worst of that reality are people like me, whose autoimmune diseases will flare if we can't get that drug that we take every day. When hospitals fill up because so many people have COVID, it doesn't matter if you followed every caution. No one is getting adequate care if the hospital is overwhelmed. Sorry, Spotify, that's not it. Thanks for the question. You asked about two different things here, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about their dog whistles. I'll make a video on their trolling tactics in the future. Turfs absolutely use a lot of coded or suggestive language or dog whistles all the time. You could argue that they're not actually dog whistles, because to trans people at least, it's very obvious what they're trying to say, but they definitely try to cover up their transphobia to make it look more like feminism to the unsuspecting. It's also how they keep themselves in denial. By not using traditionally transphobic language, it kind of helps their cognitive dissonance by making it easier to convince themselves that they're not actually a hate group. Now, the list that I'm going to give is not comprehensive. So don't take this video as definitive. But if you feel like I missed something important, please leave it in the comments. So without further ado, here are things people say to signal TERF ideology. First up is the terms they use to describe themselves. Many TERFs don't like to be called TERFs, so they'll call themselves something else. Usually radical feminist, or rad learning, or rad leaning, or something like gender atheist, or gender realist, or just gender critical. Some people that identify as gender critical may not identify as radical feminist, but their beliefs still rely on TERF ideology. Second, all of the words that they use to refer to trans people. They don't want to validate trans people's identities by simply calling them trans men and trans women. So they'll use a lot of terms that bring attention back to their assigned sex at birth. There's terms like TIM and TIF, which stands for trans-identified male and trans-identified female. This refers to trans women and trans men, respectively. There's also dysphoric male and dysphoric female. These mean the same thing as TIM and TIF. There's also TRA, trans rights activist. They may also say genderist or collectively the gender cult. Third, all of the terms that they use to refer to cis women. TERFs don't believe in the concept of cisgender, so they won't say the term cis. Instead, they'll say something like biological woman, natal woman, woman born woman, adult human female. Fourth, certain talking points. Most of the time, what TERFs say is pretty obviously transphobic, but they do have a few lines that may seem a bit vague to those who are unfamiliar with them. There's trans women experience male socialization or have male privilege. Also, non-binary people are self-identifying out of oppression. They're specifically referring to AFAB non-binary people there. There's also feminism is for females, with trans women obviously not being female there, or any talk about female-only spaces. This can mean places like women's restrooms, dressing rooms, or shelters, or just spaces to talk about feminism. Fifth, certain imagery. TERFs definitely use the Venus symbol a lot. Now, it's very possible for a non-TERF to use the Venus symbol. It predates TERFism by a long time. But just be wary of it, especially on social media. They've also recently taken to using these emojis, specifically British TERFs, because they represent the colors of the UK suffragettes. 
And that concludes my list of turf dog whistles. Again, definitely not comprehensive. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Because, hold, anyway. Anyway, this is, anyway, now hold on. What's an opinion you have that might piss some people off? Now that I'm done with college, I officially hold a history degree. And that means that I have at least some warrant to talk about this. America is, like, comically evil. Like, like, tie you to the train tracks evil. Like, big phony mustache fucking over Latin America evil. Like, lab coat and destroying the Middle East evil. Like, imprisoning the Japanese evil. Like, petting a cat so they can go into Vietnam and claim that they tried to attack us so we could go to war for profit evil. Like, Dominican Civil War of 1965, evil. Like, still practicing colonialism, but just calling them territories to make it sound better, evil. Like, purposely not treating their own people of syphilis when they were dying, but claiming that they were going to give them healthcare kinds of evil. Like, being founded on slavery, but people are trying to say that they're not, evil. Like, Hitler's gas chambers were inspired by what we did at the border, evil. Because they romanticize everything of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Because women were genuinely, legally property and had no human rights whatsoever in this country. And they missed that.